Hi, thank you for streaming one of our latest messages here at Mountain Lake Church. We hope you enjoyed the message. Please come back again very, very soon. We know that life change stories happen. They happen every day. And at Mountain Lake Church, we want to hear about your life change story. If you'd like to share your story, please visit us at mountainlake.tv and click on the story button. You can also find service locations as well as times. And if you can't come to see us in person, please know that we stream our services every Sunday at 9, 10, 30, and noon. We look forward to seeing you this weekend. I love this church and what God is doing in it. And I love kids like John just coming up and seeing life change stories written. Uh, most of you know this, but if not, I'm going to remind you one more time. Next weekend is Easter Sunday and Good Friday. And so it's going to be a great time. Uh, you want to pick a service on Good Friday and a service on Easter Sunday. There'll be two very different ones. We'll be celebrating communion together on Friday night and then uh, Easter Sunday. We're going to have baptisms, but not in here. We're going to have baptisms actually out in the lobby. And so they'll be going on all Easter Sunday. And so there's going to be people getting baptized. Man, if you need to get baptized, just show up to church in your swimsuit and T-shirt. And we'll dunk you out there in the lobby. And it's going to be a really, really uh, great time to celebrate Good Friday um, and Easter Sunday. And I want to let you know something that I'm like on cloud nine fired up about because it is something that I told you guys Back in December, and I stood up on the stage and made this promise, and it's one of those deals where we make this promise of going, man, I hope we deliver on that. And, uh, and I can tell you that our staff and volunteers have worked hours and hours and hours to make this happen, and it is going to happen starting next week, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, but I'm proud to stand on the stage and tell you that starting next weekend, Mountain Lake Church will be live streaming. How awesome is that? And so you can go to mlclive.com next Friday or Sunday, and, and it'll be up there or on our website. There'll be a, a link to it. And it's really cool because if you've got friends or family or maybe you've got loved ones that are serving overseas and on our military, you can go to church together at 9, 10, 30, and 12 every Sunday. As long as there's an internet connection, we're going to be you know, having church and what's really cool is at those hours, we're going to have the chat room open, and it will be uh, hosted by a staff member, a volunteer, but it's a great time to log on, prayer request, man, I've got questions, hey, I'm over here in Colorado or New Jersey, man, I need some help, and there's going to be people there that'll pray for them and help them uh, any way that we possibly can. So that starts uh, ne next weekend, and I'm so grateful to Dax and our uh, Chris Corchamilia and a whole bunch of people uh, that helped put that together. Now... We're in the middle of a series called Three, and if you're here last weekend, we named this series Three uh, because it is a three-week series, and we couldn't come up with a better title than that. So we're in part two of a series called Three, and today we're looking at a three-worded question, three-worded question that revolves around this topic of truth, topic of truth, absolute truth, in fact. And I was reading some this week, and I read a few quotes about truth. The Christian apologist Ravi Zachariah said this. The fact is, the truth matters, especially when you're on the receiving end of a lie. And every parent in the room said, amen, amen to that. <laughs> King David wrote this. He said, for the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. And my favorite, Jesus said this, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you we're talking about this idea of truth. Now, I'm fully aware that there are many people in this room that you're checking out church for the first time, you're not a Christian, and, and for you, you're a little skeptical of everything, and there's a lot of arguments against absolute truth. Things like relativism, pluralism, skepticism, a bunch of other isms, but, but, but bottom line is this, they think, well, there is no absolute truth. What's good for you may be different for you, may be different for me. And so it's just kind of truth. It's this gray area, ethereal concept. Man, there's not really a, a hard line when it comes to truth. And if you run into people like that at your work or at school, I'm going to give you a simple illustration right now uh, that you can use to prove that there is absolute truth. And in fact, for, for many of you, you saw this yesterday in your life, yesterday in your life. And so I'm going to give you this illustration that you can prove, regardless of wherever you go, that there is absolute truth. So by a show of hands, how many of you have 
kids, grandkids, nieces or nephews in some type of sport? Just by a show of hands. Okay, they're in basketball, football, soccer, tennis, uh, lacrosse, racquetball, ping pong. They're in some type of sport, okay? So if you go to little league fields or tennis courts or whatever, then you know that in every sport, there is a line. And this line represents a lot of things. It represents inbounds and out of bounds. It represents a fair ball, a foul ball, a three-pointer, a two-pointer, a touchdown, not a touchdown, a goal, not a goal. You know that when you go there, there are lines that everybody knows and that when that kid steps over that line, they're out of bounds. If the ball stays on this side, it's not a touchdown. If, if the ball goes out here, it's a foul ball. If it stays in here, it's a fair ball. There is absolute truth when it comes to sports because there are definite lines. And if there's absolute truth in things such as as little league and sports, then there is most certainly absolute truth when it comes to things in your life and in my life. Things about character, integrity, things about how you relate to other human beings, the truth about love, the truth about faith, the truth about hope, the truth about you, the truth about finances, And and ultimately, the truth about eternity, the truth about life after death. And and as your pastor, I care deeply about you and your life. And if you're here and you don't consider me your pastor, then I'm just a friendly guy on this stage, but I still care deeply about your life, all right? And I want you to find yourself on the right side of truth. I want you to find yourself on the right side of the truth about those things because what I have seen and experienced firsthand in my own life, to find yourself on the wrong side of the truth, the consequences can be devastating. And today we're going to look at a a very in-depth conversation between Jesus and a guy named Pilate. And there's this conversation going back and forth, and there's this this three-worded question that Pilate asks, and it revolves around truth. And there's truth hanging in the balance And there are some things in Pilate's life that begin to blur and begin to kind of make that line of truth fuzzy. And so with that in mind, if you've got your Bibles, I need you to open them up to John chapter 18, John chapter 18 and John 19. And if you don't have a Bible, man, don't worry about it. They're certainly going to put up on the screen. Now, now here's here's my goal for us today while while you're turning there. I know that it's very easy to read your Bible, or you kind of gloss over it, and it's kind of difficult. You go, man, that's a lot of words. Man, that happened a long time ago. Where did all the pictures go? You know, all that kind of stuff, right? And so it's, it's difficult to get into it and understand it, but, but here's what I want you to, to do today. It's a fascinating conversation between Jesus and Pilate, and what I want you to do is I want you to be there. I want you to be there and hear this conversation. I want you to hear the nervousness in Pilate's voice. I want you to hear the calmness in Jesus' voice. I want you to hear the yells and the screams of the crowd. I want you to smell the dirt and the dust and the the nighttime air. I want you to see the the blood that's dripping from Jesus' forehead. I want you to be there and understand this dynamic and this conversation and how Jesus is in full and complete control and the things in Pilate's life that blurred the truth. John chapter 18, verse 28. Jesus' trial before Caiaphas ended in the early hours of the morning. Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate the Passover. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if you weren't a criminal, they retorted. And then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told him. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. The Jewish leaders bring Jesus, and and Pilate goes, what do you want? Well, we want you to try him. No, you take him and judge him by your own law. We can't execute him. Only the Romans can execute him. And so Pilate goes in and has this dialogue with Jesus, verse 33. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked. Jesus replied, is this your question or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? 
Pilate retorted, your own people and their leading priests brought, me, brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders, but my kingdom is not in this world. Pilate said, so, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. You see this interesting dialogue. Pilate's there, and he's, he's questioning. You're a king? Did you, did you come up with that, or is that something that, that you heard from other people? Well, well who are you? What, what are you doing here? I, I came to tell the truth. All who listen to me know that what I say is the truth. And then Pilate asked a very profound three-worded question, verse 38. What is truth? And I don't know how he said it. I don't know if he said it flippantly or sarcastically. Well, what is truth? I don't know if he said it angrily. Well, well what, what is truth? I don't know if he said it in stress and just going, man, what is truth? However he asked it, he asked that simple question, what what is truth, Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, if you've got a pen, I need you to mark numbers one through four, mark number one right here. He is not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Pilate knows the truth is there. This man's not guilty. I, I find him not guilty. And so in order to try to appease the crowd, listen, there's a custom. You don't want to release Jesus, who's obviously innocent, or Barabbas, who's a convicted criminal. And the crowds begin to shout, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And in order to try to pacify them some more, look at chapter 19, verse 1. It says, then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his he head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews. They mocked and slapped him across the face. So having this conversation, it's obviously not pacifying the crowd. He's the governor over Judea, and he goes, he's innocent. No, no, no. Release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. In order to appease him, he has him whipped or flogged, and if you've seen passion of the Christ or anything like that, you know it's a gruesome, gruesome way to be tortured. The prisoner's hands would be tied up above him and, and the whip would come around and this whip would have pieces of either lead or bone or metal at the end. And when that whip would come around, it would get, get in the skin and then dig and flesh would be ripped apart. And this is what happens, that, that he gets flogged, he gets the crown of thorns jabbed under his head, the, the purple robe as in mockery, and look what happens. Pilate went out again and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. It's the second time that he goes, he's not guilty, he's innocent. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, look, here is the man. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify him, crucify him. The week earlier, crowds have been saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which is Palm Sunday, which is today. A week later, crucify him, crucify him. Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said, third time. I find him not guilty. He's staring at an innocent man. Pilate's wrestling around. He hears the crowds. It's interesting that Pilate asks, what is truth, when he's staring truth right in the eye? He knows he's an innocent man. He's, he's pleaded with the crowd three times. Verse 7, the Jewish leaders replied, by our law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. He took Jesus back to his headquarters again and asked him, where are you from? Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Pilate demanded. Don't you realize I have the power to release you or crucify you? Come on, man, talk to me. Don't you understand the position that you're in? Don't you understand the position that I am? I have the power to crucify you or to release you. And Jesus, and you got to get this scene. He's got the crown of thorns. His flesh is ripped open, the purple robe, and he's standing there. 
And you get the sense that Pilate is just going, man, give me something. Look at verse 11. Then Jesus said, you would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Verse 12, then Pilate tried to release him the fourth time. But the Jewish leader shouted, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Friend of Caesar was a political title, meant you were an ally of Caesar, meant you were, you were in buddy buddies, and that's what Pilate was. Anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. When they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was now about noon on the day of preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. Beforehand, he said, look, here is the man. Now he goes, look, here is your king. Away with him, they yelled. Away with him, crucify him. What? Crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned, to, turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. And there's this moment where Pilate has the line of truth drawn. He knows he's staring at an innocent man. Four times he goes, I, I find him not guilty. I find him not guilty. I find him, I'm trying to release him four times. Whether it's the crowds or whether it's his own pride or whether it's the position that he held, four times the truth was blurred. And at the end, Pilate sentenced an innocent man to die. And so here's my question for all of us here in this room today. When it comes to the truth in your life, the truth about your marriage, the truth about your finances, the truth about hope, the truth about eternity, the truth about your life, what have you allowed to blur the line of truth? What have you allowed to creep in to where now the line of truth is, is kind of fuzzy, it's kind of a gray area? What have you allowed to blur the line of truth? If you look at Pilate, he let several things blur the line of truth in his life. The first it was the crowd. It was the crowd. He tried to go before him and, hey, he's innocent. Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate allows the crowd and what they're yelling and screaming to begin to blur the lines of truth. Who have you allowed in your life to begin to blur the line of truth? Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, or the office place. But who are those people in your life that go, well, are you sure that's really the truth? Are you really sure that that's what your morals or values you should or shouldn't be? When it comes to the line of truth in your life, what have you allowed to blur it? What voices are you allowing to speak into your life that begin to blur the lines of truth? Let's go back. Let's go back to sports illustration. Right? You, got the, you got the line right there, the, the inbounds and out of bounds, foul ball, not a foul ball. And right now we're in the middle of little league season. And I'm just going to tell you this, baseball parents, man, they're an interesting bunch of people, aren't they? <laughs> yes. I know. Now, I'm a baseball dad, but man, I like, I sit up in the score booth and I kind of run the score clock, but I'm a basketball dad. And so I, I don't know about you. I do know about you. You scream and yell at the referees. I don't know if you know this or not. When the referee makes a call, the umpire makes a call, you yell and you scream, I do that, and I do my best to try not to, but you're just sitting there and you're watching your kid, and you go, that's a foul! And I'm, I'm the guy that sits way up there in the back, and, and I don't know, I guess I'm hoping in the back of my mind that one day the referee's gonna go, uh, the dad in the back, what'd you say, it was a foul? We're changing the call. <laughs> that is yet to happen. But you've seen this, when the referee, the umpire makes a call, half the crowd is happy, the other half is ticked. How crazy would it be if he goes, that's a foul ball, and the, other, the crowd goes, no, it's fair, it's fair. Well, you want to vote on it? Oh, okay, let's, we're going to change it. The truth is not decided by a majority vote. The truth in your life is not decided by how many people agree is the truth or not. What are you allowing in your life? What voices are you allowing into your life to begin to blur the lines of truth? I want you to go back and I want you to look 
I want you to look at verse 10, chapter 19, verse 10. This is Pilate speaking. He goes, why don't you talk to me? Talking to Jesus, Pilate demanded. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Pilate there allows his own pride, his own ego. It's, he goes, I'm the, I'm the top of the food chain. Don't you know that I have the power? And so Pilate allows his own pride and his own, own mind to get into his way of blurring the lines of truth. What is it in your life and in your heart and your mind to go, I'm different. My circumstances are different. My experiences are different. I'm too old. I'm too young for that truth to really apply to me. Truth is not subject to the, the individual's pride or persona or, or, or egotism. Truth is what truth is regardless of who the person is or isn't. Absolute truth is absolute truth. You cannot place your, your feet on both sides of the line depending on what day of the week it is. And Pilate goes, well, don't you know? Give me something here. I have the power to, to decide what is right and, and what is wrong. And Jesus goes, no, you don't. You wouldn't have the power unless it were given to you from above. What have you allowed into your life, your own pride, your own egotism, your own, your own mindset to allow it to blur the lines of truth in your life? Let's, let's go back to the sports illustration. Little Johnny. Little Johnny is there, and little Johnny is dribbling the basketball, right? Little Johnny steps out of bounds, dribbling the basketball. The referee blows the whistle and said the play is dead. Now, how crazy would it be if little Johnny's mom runs out on the court? Sir, 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 the referee. Hey, today is little Johnny's birthday. Can we not, can he just be in bounds? The referee's going to look at her. You know, last night, little Johnny lost his very first tooth. That's a special day for Johnny. Can we not have any out of bounds for Johnny today? You laugh at that and go, that's ridiculous. But how often we go, this is the truth, except you don't really know my circumstance or where I'm at. And so it's kind of blurry. It's kind of a gray area. Pilate's there. The crowd's screaming, yelling. And what's interesting, the crowd is religious leaders. It's the religious people. Had clout, had power, had authority. They're the ones screaming. And Pilate's confused. And he's, I'm looking at an innocent man, but he doesn't, he doesn't step on the right side of truth. And then all of a sudden, his pride gets in the way. I've got the power to do whatever I want to do. And look at the very last one. Look at verse, look at verse 12. Pilate tried to release him the last time, the fourth time. But the Jewish leaders scoffed, shouted, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. They bring before him his position that he sits in. Pilate was ruler for about a decade. He climbed the military ranks, the political ranks. He was a friend of Caesar. He sat in a very high political place, one of power, one of authority, and all of a sudden it's threatened. It's threatened by what decision he does or doesn't do. If, if I convict him, then I get to, I get to keep my position. But, but if, I, if I don't, then I lose my position. If I convict him, you, you know, this is, this is I, I lose it. You know, this is it. But, but if, I, if I let him go, then, then I'm going to lose it. So he's going back and forth. And at the end, he listens to the crowd. He holds on to his pride, values his political position. And at the end, Sentences an innocent man to die. What positions are you holding on to that you allow to blur the lines of truth in your life? Maybe it's a position in your office that you've climbed up to and your boss is asking you to do something that's not exactly legal, but you probably won't get caught. It's not really legal technically, but I mean, all of the other companies do it. And so it's not that big a deal. Do you, do you stand on the right side of the truth or value your position? Your social status at school. You, you know when it comes to your morals and your values and your purity of what you should and you shouldn't do come prom night. But man, in jeopardy is your social status at school. So do you stand on the right side of truth or do you lose your social status? 
what positions, what things you have, are you allowing to blur the lines in your life? Again, let's go back to the sports metaphor. Little Susie, she's playing soccer, and she's kicking soccer down, and all of a sudden, she kicks it, and the goalie stops it right before it crosses the line. Goalie picks it up, and all of a sudden, little Susie's parents run out on the field to the referee. And they come to the referee and go, referee, listen, uh, little Susie's grandparents, they drove all the way three hours to be here today. Can we count that as a goal? And the referee looks at little Susie's grandparents, and he recognizes them because little Susie's grandparents bought the field that the soccer field is on, and their name is above the entrance as you drive in. And in that moment, the referee has to go, you know, do I, do I care about whose name is over the field or is it a goal or is it not? What do you value more, the truth or your position? What are you allowing in your life and in your heart to blur the lines? Now, you're smart people. And you're going to go, okay, I, I get that, that, that there is a line and find yourself on the right side or the wrong side. But you're going to raise your hand and go, Chris, I've got a question. What draws the line? Hebrews 4.12. It says, the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts between joint and marrow, between soul and spirit. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The word of God is what draws the line of truth. It's what says is right and it is wrong when it comes to morals and values and finances and you and eternity. The word of God is alive and powerful. It is the sword that draws the line in the sand. So let me bottom line it for you. Because if you know me, you know that I'm, I'm a bottom line guy. If ever I walk into a meeting, my first, my first question is going, listen, let's just get to the bottom line and we'll kind of build out from there. Many of you, you're like me and you're waiting for this moment. Many of you, you're like my wife. My wife likes to tell a story to set up another story, to describe another story, to finish with a story that had nothing to do with the original story. <laughs> and so I've literally come home and go, hey, did, did you take the kids to the library this afternoon? Funny that you asked that, because this morning Micah spit up on himself and I had to wash his clothes, and then I get all the kids in the car and I realize that I'm out of gas, so I go to the gas station. I run into Beth from Mountain Lake Church. She's really nice. We should get together with her and her husband. Then I was going and I realized I hadn't eaten lunch, so I go all the way back home. I feed the kids. One had soup and one had a sandwich, and it's about time for bedtime. David gets in Kara's room. Kara gets in David's room. It's kind of crazy, but yeah, we went to the library. And if that's you, like the last 25 minutes has been for your benefit, okay? <laughs> if you're like me, what I'm about to say, you go, well, why couldn't we set this at the top and like say amen and go home? So <laughs> here's the bottom line, all right? The, where, where I really, I, you know, I want to, you to find yourself on the right side of truth in life because the consequences on the wrong side can be devastating. Now here's the bottom line. To find yourself on the right side of the truth, you must know and do what God says. To find yourself on the right side of the truth, you must know and do what God says. God is the ultimate authority. All things were created by him and for him and through him and all things come up underneath him. And so the ultimate authority is found in the word of God. And so the word of God is what draws the line. And my prayer is that you open it, you know it, and you actually do what it says, and you find yourself on the right side of the truth. You know, people come to me up after service or during the week, and, you know, they got a problem in life, and I'll listen to them and, and hear them out, and then nine out of ten times, here's one of my first questions out of my mouth. Man, I hear that, and I'm so sorry, but let me ask you this question. Uh, what are you reading in your Bible? And it gets real quiet. And they'll go, well, you know, my quiet times, Chris, have been pretty quiet lately. And um, they kind of squirm. And I go, no, no, just what are you reading? Well, I read the verses that you put up on the screen on Sunday. So I read those. And, and I just go, what are you reading in your Bible? And they go, well, I kind of thought you could help. And I'm going, I, I can help. But I would much rather you open this up yourself, read it and study and go, this is what the truth is. Now let me obey it and find myself on the right side of the truth. 
But here's what happens, and, and I get this comment a lot, and I think it's kind of humorous because I, I get this comment going, Chris, I, I can't study the Bible. It's so confusing. I don't know where to find anything in there about my life or my situation. And I laugh because I go, really? You can Facebook stalk your ex-girlfriend from ninth grade, <laughs> but you can't find out what the Bible says about your life. And you can, people research everything. I mean, you go to YouTube, you can figure out how to fix anything on your automobile. You can figure out how to do your taxes. But when it comes to the Bible, man, that's kind of confusing. My hope and my goal as, as your pastor or just as a friendly guy on the stage, however you think of me, is that, man, you would just begin to open it up and go, God, what does your word say about my life? In my situation, God, draw the line of truth in this hand. God, give me the wisdom and the courage to find myself on the right side of the truth. And if you're a student in this room, man, I'm begging you to, to listen to me right now. And you're in high school, and, and I understand the pressures of high school are greater than any adult in this room can possibly imagine. I get that. And you're walking through life and you're bombarded with all these voices or with peer pressure or with, with your position at your school. If you're a student, open up God's word or, or tap on God's word. If you've got a digital, I don't really care. But get into it and go, God, what is the line of truth in my life? And God, give me the wisdom to do what it says. Pilate's there and he's got the line of truth drawn. And there's voices, and there's his pride and his power and the position. And at the end, he finds himself on the wrong side of truth, and he sentences an innocent man to die. In order for you and for me to find ourselves on the right side of the truth, we must know and do what God says. I'll finish with this. And it's what John wrote later in life in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. He says, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commands, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus to find yourself on the right side of the truth. Love the way Jesus loved. To find yourself on the right side of the truth. Treat others the way Jesus treated others. To find yourself on the right side of the truth. Both know and do what Jesus did. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray for everybody in this room. And Lord, I know sometimes the truth in life, it's a lot of other voices speaking into it. There's a lot of things that begin to blur and truth just kind of seems like this gray area. But God, my prayer today, Lord, is that the word of God would begin to just pierce to the core of people's hearts. God, it would not just be some book on the shelf, God, but it would be alive and, and, and powerful and, and pointing out things in their life and, and exposing the truth to them. God, my prayer is that you'd give us all the wisdom and the courage to know and to do and to find ourselves on the right side of the truth. Now, if you're here, I don't know what your story of faith is, but let me just tell you what God says in his word. He says that he loves you and that he cares for you regardless of the deepest, darkest thing that you've ever done. And he has a plan and a purpose for you and he desires to spend eternity in heaven with you and all you have to do is to place your faith in the son Jesus and what he did on the cross and the fact that God did raise him from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. You will have eternal life. It says when you get the son, you get it all. You get hope, you get peace, you get eternal life. If you've never done that, you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you've never found yourself on the right side of the truth when it comes to eternity, and you want to do that here today, the Bible is clear. It says, all who call upon the Lord will be saved. I'm going to lead you through a prayer of salvation. And hear me carefully. There's nothing super spiritual about this, these words. It's just really a confession of your heart before your heavenly father. If you're ready to trust Jesus, just 
repeat this very simple prayer after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Without you, I cannot get into heaven. So come into my heart. Be Lord of my life from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. Amen.